Welcome to Chemistry with Caroline. In this video, we're going to look at some tips and tricks for solving rearrangements in SN1 type reactions. So I have here a reaction scheme. We've got the starting material that has a leaving group on it on a secondary type carbon, so the iodine leaving group. And then we have our product distribution on the right hand side. So the first thing to do when looking at a problem is identify any unexpected products. And by unexpected products, I mean products that look like they resulted from a rearrangement. So is the skeletal structure of the product different than that of the starting material? So if we look at the structure of our starting material, we have a five member ring here. And then on the ring, I have a methyl group coming off of this sort of top carbon. And then on the next door neighbor carbon to that, I have another methyl group. And then I have an ethyl group coming off. If I look at the first product that's drawn, I also have a five membered ring and I have a methyl group coming off the top carbon and I have a methyl group and an ethyl group coming off of the carbon that's next door. And my nucleophile is in the exact same position where the leaving group used to be. So this would be an expected product. Kind of a straightforward, the leaving group leaves, a carbocation is formed and then the nucleophile comes in. But if I look at the next one, I still have a five membered ring and I still have this methyl but now I have an isopropyl group on there. So I'm gonna change colors so we can keep track. So this is different than the skeletal structure of my starting material and my nucleophile is on a different carbon than where my leaving group was. So this would be an unexpected product. It looks different than the skeletal structure of my starting material and it must have resulted from a rearrangement. And then lastly, I have this one and right away I can tell that that is unexpected because it has a six membered ring and I started with a five membered ring. And so both of these products must have resulted from a rearrangement and in fact different rearrangements because their skeletal structures are different from one another as well. So let's go to the next slide and learn the next tip. I've redrawn our reaction scheme here and labeled the products one, two, and three. The next tip is to work backwards. So it can often be hard to start from just a reactant and go all the way to the product, especially when a rearrangement is happening. But if we look at our products, we can work backwards to figure out what carbocation intermediate must have been present to form that. So wherever my nucleophile ended up, that's where the carbocation must have been in an SN1 type reaction. So if we look at product one, the carbocation must have been right here. That's where the nucleophile ended up on that product and that is where the leaving group originally left from. So this would be the first carbocation we would see. The second product, the carbocation would have been in a different spot right here because that's where the nucleophile is for that species. And then if we look at the last one, I've got this rearranged structure and the carbocation must have been here because that is the carbon where the nucleophile ended up. So now that we know where we're going in terms of the reactive intermediates, we can piece together the entire mechanism because we also know how to start, right? We know that the leaving group leaves. So let's go to the next slide and we'll work out the whole mechanism. All right, so previously we had figured out the carbocation intermediates that would yield the product that we see on the other side. So the first step in this SN1 reaction is that the leaving group leaves. We already have a good leaving group in iodine, so there's nothing we need to do to make that a better leaving group. It can just go on its own. That will generate this original carbocation. And if the SH came in and attacked, that would give us our first product right there. Okay. Now we had said, I'm going to go back and label these products again. So let's say one, two, and three, that we know that product two must have had a carbocation in this position because that's where the nucleophile ended up. So now what you need to do is figure out how did you get from this original carbocation to the other carbocation that would generate number two. So let's say this is from number one and this is from number two. And that leads us to the third step, which is to figure out what is different between those two reactive intermediates, because that's gonna tell you what shifted. So looking at this, remember I have methyl, methyl, 
and then I have an ethyl group on there. But now there's no more methyl on that carbon. The methyl shifted and you can see that I ended up with an isopropyl group over here. So what probably happened is a methyl shift and the methyl shift off of the carbon right here will result in an electron deficient carbon at that site and generate carbocation number two. So here for clarity, I've redrawn this. This methyl is going to shift onto that carbocation. So this methyl right here is this methyl right here. Okay, it's shifted over. When it moves from that carbon, the carbon becomes electron deficient and then the um, methyl group moves over to the other side creating the isopropyl. And so what will happen then is after that shift occurs, some of the nucleophile will intercept this carbocation and so that will give me my final product with my nucleophile at that new position because of the newly generated carbocation. So I use equilibrium arrows here for a nucleophilic attack. This arrow is not an equilibrium arrow. Shifts tend to be in one direction to a more stable product. And so in this case, you're going from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation, and that's what's driving that shift. The reverse activation energy is too large to be overcome. So let's look at the last example, the ring expanded example as well. Okay, so we had identified this carbocation intermediate as the precursor to this final product, and we know that we originally had this carbocation intermediate generated when the leaving group left. So again, we're gonna use that last tip, which is what is different? So here, uh, one big difference, right, is that we're going from a five-membered ring to a six-membered ring. So there's a ring expansion here, but you can also see that you have a methyl, a methyl, and an ethyl here, and on this rearranged product, we have three methyl groups, and my ring has expanded. And so I'm gonna change colors here for a mechanism. Um, let me number, so we'll say one, two, three, four, five, and six, just so that we can keep track of what's going on. So carbon one currently is a carbocation. Carbon two is bonded to carbon three and carbon six. I'm going to expand the ring from five to six members, which means that the bond between two and six is going to hop out and expand that ring. That's gonna leave two deficient and make it a carbocation. So let's use a different color. I'll use yellow for my mechanism arrow. So the bond between two and six, my arrow is gonna start there and it's gonna end on my carbocation carbon. Okay, so this is starting in the middle of this bond saying this is shifting out. It's just like a methyl or a hydride shift. Um, it's just that it's connected via the other side. So if I number on this intermediate step, this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so carbon one had had that methyl group on it to begin with that was outside of the ring. It still has that methyl group on it. And then carbon two has a methyl group remaining. Carbon three has a methyl group. And now carbon six is bonded to carbon one instead of carbon two. So that is a ring expansion. That's how you get that intermediate. And once that intermediate is present, again, it will get intercepted by some of the nucleophile. And that gives us our final product. Um, with a nucleophile on the six-membered ring. Again, we're going from a secondary carbon to a tertiary carbon in this example. So uh, more substitution at the carbon center that will have the carbocation on it, or with ring expansions and ring contractions, the relieval of ring strain are two major factors that drive rearrangement type reactions. So this has been some strategies for how to approach rearrangements in SN1 type reactions. If you found this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Thanks.